So as that amazing master of the macabre, Shirley Jackson says, no live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. And boy, do we have absolute reality constantly smacking us in the face these days. And when absolute reality feels so much like a nightmare, how do you allow yourself to get back to dreaming? How do you even begin to crawl out of the valley of dry bones and catch your breath? Yesterday morning, when I awoke to the news that an anti-Semitic white supremacist terrorist had opened fire inside a Pittsburgh synagogue and that there were multiple casualties, I did not know what to do with this morning. Over the past two years, I feel like that's becoming a common feeling for faith leaders. It's getting harder and harder to keep up with the hate. And by the time each worship service rolls around, it's getting harder and harder to know which affront, which atrocity should get the most airtime that morning. But yesterday morning, everything planned about this service felt especially wrong. We already had an overstuffed litany of offenses from the previous week to explore, from the latest attack on the trans community to the latest attacks on immigrants to the racism-fueled murder of two black customers at a Kentucky grocery store to threats of a dozen pipe bombs in the mail. But this morning, we were going to have a dreamy hour of Halloween fun at Judson. We had asked everyone to dress up in costumes. We had planned a prelude about a happy phantom. Thank you, Abigail, and thank you, Tori. We had planned a choir performance based on the diabolical dialogue of the witches from Macbeth. We had a cartoon on our bulletin cover. We were going to sing the Adams Family theme and snap, apparently. I was planning to tell a ghost story as my sermon. And it suddenly all felt really wrong. It all felt inadequate. It all felt inappropriate. It all felt insanely hopeless under the conditions of the current absolute reality. To be honest, I was resistant to even continue with the service as planned. I don't know about you, but I've been pretty resistant to a lot of things lately. If you've been feeling resistant to a lot of things lately, and we're being constantly reminded to resist. Resist. All capital letters, resist. So this feeling of resistance that I was starting to feel bubble up inside of me, pun not intended, was both familiar and strangely comforting. And as more and more details rolled in and the number of reported dead grew, I felt oddly alone in my resistant thought exercise. It was as if for a moment I completely forgot that I'm not solely responsible that, for everything that happens here today. It was as if for a moment I completely forgot that there is an entire congregation of smart, resilient, creative, big-hearted people who keep this place afloat, that there's a hard-working staff and a fierce senior minister and even something like God that are all holding this place together, together. And as I scrambled to find the right ways to honor the devastated Pittsburgh community and to respond to the grief and fear of an entire religious community as emails continued to pour in asking about security in this building, asking about our own safety, I felt entirely alone. And I sunk deeper and deeper into the valley wanting to help people to grieve just right, wanting to hold people just right, wanting to heal people just right. And even in the midst of how 
deeply I know how deeply this community cares for itself, I was able to convince myself that I was completely alone in my complicated feelings of grief and regret, basically responsible for getting everything right when we're really in a moment when nothing done can possibly feel right. But then, as Donna alluded to earlier, that's what terrorism is trying to do, right? Terrorism is trying to wreak so much havoc and so much fear that alienation becomes the only thing that feels safe. Selfishness becomes the only thing that feels safe. Terrorism is trying to wreak so much destruction that it convinces us that creation is not something that we are really good at. Terrorism is trying to wreak so much death that it convinces us that we are not a resurrection people. But look at our ancient testimony. This text was originally chosen to be used in a bit of a different way this morning, but it's hauntingly appropriate now. This morning, as we grieve with our Jewish friends, we can look at this Jewish text, this description of Jewish prophet Ezekiel's classic vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, and remember that this is a resurrection story. This is a scene of devastation and destruction and deep, deep grief. But even if you know nothing else about Ezekiel, you can see right here that the Christians didn't invent the idea of resurrection. The ancient Jewish community was thinking about resurrection centuries before Jesus' stone got rolled away. And of course, I like the story of Jesus. It behooves me to like the story of Jesus. But unlike that classic Christian tale of one single hero resurrecting alone and overcoming state-sanctioned terrorism all on his own, this Ezekiel story, this Jewish story, this Jewish story from a people who were targeted and terrorized yesterday simply because they are who they are, and, they, and simply because they have committed themselves to helping the stranger. This Jewish story is about the faith-fueled resurrection of an entire people. We can learn a lot from them. Someone asked me last week, even before this latest tragedy, how I can possibly be a faith leader in times like these. And it took me a moment to think about it, I'm embarrassed to say. But I eventually answered that I'm actually really, really grateful to be a faith leader in times like these because it tasks me every day with having faith. And if I didn't have that task, if I didn't have all of you in this room trying to figure out where our faith might be hiding, if we didn't have all of us in this room trying to figure out how to find our faith again week after week, I might not find it on my own. Stephen King is right. Alone may just be the most awful word that we have. But when we're looking for our faith together, we're not alone. We're here. We're in danger in this room. That's been proven to us over and over again. But we are here, looking for our faith together, not at our homes, alone. I do not know the morality of preaching good news in times like these. I do not know the morality of finding joy in wearing a Halloween costume in the midst of tragedy upon tragedy. All I know for sure is that no matter what we do in today's service, it will feel inadequate. And here's one more thing I do know. This 
inadequacy, this valley of dry bones, isn't the final answer. This is a resurrection story. The Jewish people know a thing or two about faith-fueled resurrection. Even this short Jewish text from Ezekiel contains nine uses of the word ruach. Anybody know what ruach means? What does it mean? Breath. Ruach means breath. This text is only 10 lines long. And it's got this Hebrew term, ruach, almost as many times within it. And ruach means breath. There's all the other anatomical stuff that makes us humans. Bone is mentioned twice. Sinews are mentioned twice. Flesh is mentioned twice. And all of these tangible bodily things are important to keep humans up and alive and walking and resisting. But it's the breath, the spirit, the ruach that is most important. It's the breath that fills a people with resurrective spirit to add to their resistance. Resistance without resurrection is like a zombie body with no breath to let it live. It's walking around. You've all seen these zombie movies. You've seen The Walking Dead. There's no ruach. They're not breathing. They have blood. They have bone, they have sinew, they have flesh, they have no ruah. We have to get the ruah from somewhere else. So we must call out and name white Christian supremacist terrorism when we see it. We must stand against it and we can't resurrect and survive on simply being against something. We must continue to fill the void left by hate and terrorism with something else. We resurrect and survive on the breath and spirit of being for something. We resurrect and survive on the breath and spirit of faith-fueled love in the face of hate. Our Jewish siblings have known this for millennia. And we are watching them again lead themselves out of this valley of bones. Last night's vigil in Union Square was a constant call for both resistance, but also resurrection. They are asking for our solidarity, but they are modeling the movement for us. They are modeling resurrection for us. They are asking us, and they are teaching us how to be faith leaders. Because when I was in my little selfish zone yesterday, worried about what a faith leader is supposed to do in this moment, you know what I forgot? We are all faith leaders. I'm not the only faith leader here. Donna isn't the only faith leader here. Community ministers, people with seminary degrees, they are not the only faith leaders here. We are all faith leaders if we choose faith-fueled breath over hate and fear. And we are faith leaders not because our faith is never shaken. Not because we don't often feel like bags of dry bones with nothing else to give. We are faith leaders because through it all, when more tragedy piles on, the promise of ruah, the promise of faith-fueled breath is still present. We know that in the midst of alienating destruction, moments of connection and creation are begging us to be for something when so much fear and hate is forcing us to be against something. Yes, we are resistors. I don't want to speak against resisting. I like resisting. But we are resurrectors as well. That's what we have to give to these resistance movements right now. Ruah, faith, resurrection. And resurrection isn't just some Christian thing. 
It isn't just some Jewish thing. It's a human thing as important as bones and sinew and flesh. And if you fear that the ideas of ruach and resurrection are too heady and abstract for times like these, I know something that will ground both in absolute reality in the coming moments. At the end of this service, like every year, our children are going to leave their Sunday school rooms and come up to this sanctuary. They are going to be in costume. They are going to be on sugar highs. They are going to be collecting loose change for Heifer International. And we will ooh and ah at all of their costumes, and they will have no idea about the death and destruction and hate and fear that is on all of our minds and hearts right now, even as we ooh and ah. But we will see creative, dreamy ruah in front of us. We will see breath in front of us. We will see resurrection in front of us. No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. If larks and katydids can do it, we better be able to do it. And we've got the tools to do it. But until we have the strength to dream again, may we resurrect the spirits of those 11 faith leaders murdered yesterday. And may we pledge again to be resurrected faith leaders who follow in their wake. So there's no way to tie this up. There's no way to wrap up ruah, and put a bow on it, give it to you so you can take it home and take it out when you get there and enjoy it. It's the coming back here that keeps it going. So I'm just going to end by saying the 11 names of the faith leaders that were murdered yesterday. You see their names up here as well. And 11 little candles, small representations for their spirits. Daniel Stein, Joyce Feinberg, Richard Gottfried, Rose Mallinger, Jerry Rabinowitz, Cecil Rosenthal, David Rosenthal, Bernice Simon, Sylvan Simon, Melvin Wax, Irving Younger. We speak these names. We breathe these names. We follow in their wake. Amen.